that, of course, is the winter magical effect that you get in St. Petersburg, where regularly the temperature will be minus 10 Celsius. But as you can see, hence it being such an important military location, especially for the Navy, as you can see, the water doesn't fee, uh, freeze. So you get this steamy, foggy effect coming off the warm water on the Gulf of Finland and the city that floated on a sea of gold at sunset in the summer seems to float on clouds in the winter. So those are the kind of spaces that we have in mind. And I'll put just in the background here, the card game that's gonna become so important to us and the title, Pika Vyadama. And here you have the Russian playing card with D for Dama instead of Q for Queen. So let's spend a little time with the text. I want to make sure, even though you're not doing quotations on your exam, that we do read the text a little bit together. So at the very beginning of Pika Vayadama, named obviously for the card game, it's the same card game here, France, as you know, early in the story, um, and of course in Russia. We're given the example of a series of um, important young people, military primarily, who are doing what I suspect you would hope that powerful, important military young people do not spend their time doing. They're drinking champagne and they're playing cards. Pushkin wants to tell us a great magic story, maybe a kind of fairy tale, but he's also very committed to social critique and to social satire. We begin with a conversation between German, and that's how it would be said in Russian, Herman, that's fine if you want to say it that way, but German is how his name would be said, which is obviously going to be important in just a moment. So on page 2287, we're introduced to our two characters, primary ones, Tomsky, who's going to tell us a little story in a moment, and German. And you get a feel for Pushkin's wicked sense of humor. So the word for German in Russian doesn't sound like German at all. It's Nemetsky. It's the one we do not understand. It actually is the same as Barbaros, the one who speaks a language we don't understand. But in the middle of the page, as all of these beautiful young people are wasting time in a luxurious way, we get the introduction by Tomsky of German, and we get this punning sentence, works in Russian as well, German Nemetsky. German, Herman, playing with English and Russian at the same time. So Herman seems, or German seems to be a slightly boring person, at least according to Tomsky. And then Tomsky launches into this really, really interesting story about his grandmother. And I hope you had a feel for it. It's on the one hand, it's just a story. It's a family story. But it begins rather like a genre I suspect all of you are familiar with. Once upon a time, Gilles in Russian, or Il était une fois in French. Once upon a time. 60 years ago, my grandmother was in Paris. She was losing very badly at cards when somebody came over with the name Saint-Germain and offered to lend her the money to get her out of trouble. And now on page 2288, to get her out of trouble because she was losing at the Queen's game here. Remarkably, with the tip from this strange uh, figure, this unknown foreign person, she manages to pull precisely the correct cards. And so we're told at the bottom of 2288, she chose three cards and played them one after the other, all three won, and my grandfather, my grandmother recouped herself completely. So everyone sitting around, dropping their own cards down, drinking their champagne, has different opinions about it. Pure luck, uh, just happenstance. Things just happen like this, how strange, nothing to be made of it. German, who seems like he might be an important character, very simply says, it's just a fairy tale. These kind of things simply don't happen. Third person suggests maybe she was cheating and the cards were marked. So we're given this funny story about how is it that you get yourself out of trouble? How do you get ahead in the world, especially financially? Now we jump into chapter two, and it's no longer German and Tomsky. Now it's somewhere completely different. I also think it's interesting that chapter two starts in French rather than in Russian or the English that you're reading. And we get a real feel for how cruel and snobby and pretentious Petersburg society is, not only for using French perhaps, but for what's in it. So the little opening fashionable conversation is, il paraît que monsieur est décidément pour les suivantes. Que voulez-vous madame, elles sont plus fraîches. I mean, it's a really unpleasant joke about why this sir is interested in predating on 
those who are in very vulnerable positions because they're female servants in a household. And then he makes a joke about how they are fresher than people like the woman that he's talking to in the conversation. Pushkin's giving us a really grim view, however beautiful, of the actual morals and the types of people who are living in Petersburg. So we get introduced to the Countess and to her household. And the Countess is um, introduced in a remarkable way. What do we need to know about her? That she's old, that she's rich, and that she doesn't care about anybody. At the top of 2290, her best friend's death will be announced to her. And as we're told by Pushkin at the top of 2290, when Daria Pretrovna dies, the Countess heard the news previously unknown to her with the greatest indifference. Nobody cares. Live or die in Petersburg, nobody cares. But she has a young woman that's living with her, Lizaveta, whom we're slowly going to get introduced to. And at the top of 2290, we find out that Lizaveta would love to be the heroine of a novel. She'd love to have a grand romantic story about her. And yet by the bottom of 2291, Pushkin's making clear to us that this is a bit of a pipe dream. So what's Lizaveta really like, the one who wants to be a hero in a novel, a heroine in a novel? We're told at the bottom of 2291, indeed, Lizaveta Ivanovna was a most unfortunate creature. As Dante says, you shall learn the salt taste of another's bread and the hard path up and down his stairs. And who better to know the bitterness of dependence than the poor ward of a well-born old lady? So whatever the personality may be of Elizabeth, Lizaveta, Lisa, whatever her personality may be, what Pushkin wants us to know is that she, she is a victim, a victim of class and a victim of poverty. There is no word for Pushkin actually across his career more painful than the word dependence. And maybe no word he values more than its opposite, independence. Pushkin actually hung out with a group of revolutionaries. You probably all know their name, the Decembrists, because of the contemporary rock band. They tried 100 years before the Russian Revolution to overthrow the Tsar. Pushkin was close enough to them that he was arrested and sent into exile because of his revolutionary tendencies. So the story is very much going to be a critique of the materialism, of the callousness, of the superficiality, of precisely the world in which Pushkin lives himself. A good evidence for that snobism would be what happens on 2292. And that's the party that Lizaveta attends, where first she's um, viewed by Gernman, one where she's being told which engineers and which military officers are of high enough rank and have enough money that she could possibly be interested in them. On 2293, we get introduced to Gernman himself. We're told he was the son of a Russianized German, like the picture of Albrecht that I showed you, from whom he'd inherited a small amount of money. So I'm always encouraging you to close read, and the close reading I would recommend here is not just that he's got a bit of money he inherited, that is important, it gives him some position. I'd suggest the most important word in that sentence is the word small. Just enough money to work his way up in society, but not enough money to make himself secure. As we go down the page, we get a speech from German about how he would never do gambling. And I imagine many of us think that someone who protests so much that he would never gamble may be somebody who's very vulnerable to that addiction. And if you look at his particular speech, I hope it reminds you actually of the way Hamlet speaks. You see all the ellipses, the dot, dot, dots, and the question marks. He's so emotionally intense at this moment that he can't quite finish his sentences. And so he says, thinking to himself, it's a kind of soliloquy, like Hamlet's soliloquies. And the story itself, he says, can one really believe it? No, economy, moderation, industry, these are my three winning cards. These will treble my capital, increase it sevenfold, and earn for me ease and independence. So he seems awfully interested in Tomsky's story, awfully interested in the gambling and the cards, even though he says, no, 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 never me. And the other thing I invite you to keep in mind at this point is there are three numbers, if you like, that are implicit in what he just said. There's him, that's number one. There's the three winning cards, the three virtues he thinks he has, economy, moderation, and industry. And then there's seven, the sevenfold increase in his wealth that he anticipates. 
the narrator tells us at the bottom of the page that he's totally fired up by imagining the story of the playing cards. The story keeps flipping back and forth between Lisavieta and the Countess on the one hand and German on the other. Having met back and forth and the two begin to get to know each other, by 2296, German is gonna bring those two worlds together. And like Shakuntala and Dushanta, when the two of them come together, it's going to be immediately disastrous. Perhaps ironically or sarcastically on 2296, German is compared by Pushkin to, be a, to being a tiger about to pounce as he decides to go into the old woman's private dressing room and demand that she tell him her secret. In many ways, Pushkin is credited for creating intense personalities, but rather like Hamlet and Faust, they're often very much anti-heroes rather than heroes. In 2297, Pushkin will clearly distance himself from German, who has turned and stepped back into the dark study so as to stalk the Countess and get her secret. The particular sentence I wanted you to consider is, in his heart, there echoed something like the voice of conscience, but it grew silent and his heart was once more turned to stone. Like the city of Petersburg itself, built out of granite blocks, there is no conscience, only stoniness in our hero. And the Countess begins to undress before the looking glass. And I want to have us introduce a little bit, not only to the game of Faro, which I'll get back to a little bit later, but specifically to the image of the Countess and her wards. So it is actually the Countess Samoylova who is the basis, the historical basis, along with people like Ushakova, who I'll show you in a moment, for the Countess. Here we have the idea of an older woman, with a young girl, these are dressed up both for a costume party, dressed up as kind of like Shakespeare character and dressed up like someone from the Ottoman court in Istanbul. And here we have the exact woman who's a bit like Samalova, but this is the specific woman, Pushkin knew her and people might well have recognized her, drawn from life, who's the model for the Countess here. And this is then the Countess in all of her finery coming from a reception who's beginning to undress herself. And as she takes away all the layers of artifice, she begins to remind us more and more of a character that you might enjoy reading about, especially if you like fairy tales. And this is um, Baba Yaga, the ultimate deadly, dangerous, terrifying Russian fairy tale witch. And it's Ivan Bilibin's image of her from about 80 years later than the story. There she is riding through the forest. She doesn't fly on a broomstick like uh, Western uh, witches. She flies on a haunted butter churn that she is couched on top of, flying through the forest on the way to her house, which is on chicken legs that can run away from you, into which children are lured so that they can be eat it, eaten. She's a cannibal and absolutely terrifying. So I wanted to keep her in mind and keep in mind the numbers. So on 2298, having stalked her in this disturbing way, German makes his pitch to her. I entreat you by the feelings of a wife, a lover, a mother, by everything that is sacred in life, do not deny my request. Reveal your secret to me. What is it to you? Perhaps it's bound up with some dreadful sin, with the loss of eternal bliss, with some contract made with the devil. He said he loved the play Faust. As we get this image of begging, being willing to do anything, all the most terrible, deceptive, and ugly things possible, the old woman answers absolutely nothing. And this is where German will actually call her a witch. And then Petersburg magical kind of work happening here. He pulls a pistol in order to threaten to shoot her, maybe even to shoot her. And although he never fires the shot, she dies of fright. In Petersburg, you don't actually have to discharge the bullet to kill someone. On 2300, 